Will you turn with me in your Bibles to Paul's letter to the Romans chapter 12 where we're concerned this evening with verses 3 to 8. And by way of introducing our study, I want to remind you of some rather searching words spoken by Jesus regarding some people who were proud of their religious convictions. They were men of sound doctrine. They were also people who were proud of their spiritual positions. They were leaders. And they were people who regarded themselves as being very spiritual compared to other people. Not pleasant words to live with. And these words are inscribed in Matthew chapter 23. I'll read them to you at the beginning of the chapter. Then said Jesus to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So practice and observe whatever they tell you, but not what they do. For they preach, but they do not practice. Do you see what Jesus was saying? And do you see the relevance of this to Romans chapter 12? The spirituality that these people were claiming, now they were, they were of sound doctrine, they were in that sense committed to their religious establishment, and they did hold places of leadership. But do you see what Jesus was saying? The spirituality that they claimed was not being expressed in their daily life. And the obvious impact or inference of Jesus' words is simply their spirituality is not genuine. Because if our spirituality is not expressed in the whole compass of the way that we live and the way that we handle other people and the way that we do our work, then our spirituality is a fraud. And this is the issue that Paul begins to deal with. And he deals with it. I hope this doesn't make you uncomfortable if you're planning to come every Sunday evening. He deals with this subject right through chapters 12, 13, 14, and into chapter 15. But keep in mind that what we are studying here is chapter 12. It's not the first chapter. And all that we are learning from chapter 12 onwards is based upon and emerges from and is empowered by the gospel truths that are expounded in chapters 1 to 11, which truths we claim to have believed. And of course, if we haven't believed the truths of the gospel, and the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, if we haven't believed, then we will never be able to live the kind of lives that are spoken about in chapters 12, 13, 14, and into 15. So I suppose the thing we've got to be clear about, and no doubt I'll emphasize this again and again in the course of the weeks, we've got to make sure we really are Christians. That we have come to Christ, we have trusted Christ, our sins have been forgiven, we have been born again of the Spirit of God, and the very Spirit of God lives within our hearts, the enabling, the source of the enabling for the living, the kind of life we are called to live. In the course of one of our expositions in the earlier chapters of Romans, I referred to the verse in Philippians chapter 2, I think it's verses 12 and 13, where Paul says, words that are often misunderstood, work out your own salvation. It doesn't mean that you've got to do a lot of work to acquire salvation. The verse means work out the salvation that you have, the salvation that you've been given in Jesus Christ now, work it out in the whole pattern of your life, your personality, and your activity, because it is God who is working in you. 
And so chapters 1 to 8 of Romans deal with the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. Chapters 9, 10, and 11 really deal with world history. The real world in which God's purposes of salvation are worked out and demonstrated. And the outworking of God's purposes in the world have as one very significant effect the exposure of faith and unbelief. Then we come to chapters 12 to 15, which deal in general, I say it in general terms, they deal with the expression in the lives of Christian believers of the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. One word of caution. We do not suggest in any sense, nor do we try to deny in any sense, the goodness and the kindness and the gentleness and the care that you very, very often can see in the lives of unbelievers. <clears throat> Some people who never darken the door of a church and have no interest in God or Christ or anything like that, some of them are immensely kind and caring and gentle. And I would be the last to try to deny that that is so. The sadness is that goodness and kindness and gentleness as works that we do never bring us to God and can never bring us to heaven. We need Jesus Christ for that. And so when we come to chapter 12 of Romans, in the first two verses, the emphasis is on the need for decision. These first two verses of chapter 12 are a call to commitment. Nothing half-hearted about it. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is your spiritual worship. Are you going to be Christ, or are you not going to be Christ? Are you going to go with Christ, or are you not going to go with Christ? That's the decision that has to be made. And involved in that decision, there is the deliberate choosing and developing of a certain mindset, a certain attitude, if you like whereby we refuse both the pressures and the conditioning of society. We refuse to be conformed or squeezed into the mold of this world, and we are willing to be transformed by the renewing of our, of our minds. And in that way we prove we discover, if you like, that the will of God is good, it is perfect, it is flawless, and it is altogether acceptable. And we dealt with that last Sunday evening. Then we come in to the next section, verses 3 to 8. And verse 3 has a very individual emphasis. Verses 4 and 5 speak of the church, the company of believers or the body of believers. Verses 6, 7 and 8 deal with service. And although we won't go on any further, verses 9 to 13 have an emphasis with regard to attitude. And verses 14 to 18 of the chapter have to do with relationships and how to handle relationships. And verses 19 to 21 have the emphasis of trust. Trusting God. Facing up to all sorts of things that we cannot handle. Sometimes because we don't understand. Sometimes because we don't have the capacity. So we trust God to work it out. And the more I read and study Romans chapter 12, the more I see that the whole chapter is full of wise counsel, both spiritual 
and psychological. So let's see what it says. Verse 3. By the grace given to me, says Paul, I bid or I charge everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith which God has assigned. Don't think too high, but on the other hand, don't denigrate yourself. Both extremes are wrong. Now, Paul says, I bid you take this seriously. And the first principle is to recognize the grace of God. Because apart from the grace of God, we are nothing, we have nothing, and we can do nothing. Now, no, no, no matter our background, our pedigree, our education, our business acumen, our money, or our very gifts, various gifts. <coughs> Although these are all benefits in our human lives, in themselves, they are neutral. You say, what do you mean? It all depends on what use we make of them. And all these varied, various gifts, whether we have some of them or all of them, or maybe just one of them, in the context of Christian life, they can in actual fact become a hindrance. Now I've got various references marked in my Bible tonight, and as I said this morning, very often the scriptures are the best exposition of the scriptures. And I'm turning over my Bible to Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, beginning at the end of verse 3, where he speaks about how important it is to glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Then he says, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if any other man thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, the supreme tribe, a Hebrew son born of Hebrew parents, as to the law, a well-instructed Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under... Oh, what a claim. As to righteousness in relation to the Ten Commandments, blameless. My, what a gifted man. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as refuse in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness or a salvation of my own based on the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. Righteousness as a gift from God that depends on faith. Now this is the Paul who says, now I charge you by the grace of God given to me. Oh, he says, I, I've no right to say this to you apart from the grace of God. And so in my Bible I turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4 at verse 7 where Paul says to a company of Christians who are very proud of their spirituality and their spiritual gifts, who sees anything different in you? What, what makes you different from anybody else? What, what makes you think you're a great Christian? What have you that you did not receive? Oh, you say, well, I'm, I'm faithful who gave you the grace of faithfulness? Oh, you see, I, I, I love my Bible and I know my Bible. Who, who created that love in your heart? 
Oh, you say, well, preacher, I'm, I, I, I must admit, I don't want to be proud, but you know, I'm, I'm a pretty good Sunday school teacher, and any time I'm called to do a service, I can do it pretty well. Who gave you the capacity to do it? Is it all your own? Are, are you a do-it-yourself person? Who sees anything different in you? What have you that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if it wasn't a gift? Why do you boast about it as, as if it was all your own doing? So back to Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. I charge every one of you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, accord, each according to the measure of faith which God has assigned him. We're, we're speaking here about humility. Now, what do we mean by humility? Well, I think, first of all, humility means <coughs> recognizing our limitations and accepting our limitations without being frustrated or annoyed because you don't have gifts or capacities that other people have. That's humility. Secondly, I would say that humility has to do <coughs> with recognizing that all our gifts on every level I'm speaking about our daily work as well as our Christian life. Humility means recognizing that all our gifts and all our different capacities have been given to us by God to be used for the God who gave them. Not to be used for ourselves. To be used, yes, to be developed, to be cultivated, to be instructed, to, to, to make these gifts and capacities the very best that they can possibly be. There's, there's no denial of ambition, rightful ambition in humility. But ambition and humility can often fight. But recognizing these gifts and capacities as having been given by God to be used for the God who gave them and to serve as God directs, if God says, serve there, we are not told, oh, but God, I'd much rather. I'm sure that would be a better area for my gifts. And to use these gifts and capacities given to us by God to serve God as God directs and to use these gifts in a way that draws attention to God, not to ourselves. Now, some people who are very gifted humanly, and some people who claim to be very gifted spiritually, seem to have a great capacity for drawing attention to themselves. Not a very productive exercise, whether for the person or for anybody else. I can still remember many years ago now the man who said to me in all seriousness and in some ways he was a very gifted man. He was an artist, a very accomplished artist. But he said to me in all seriousness, well, you know, humility is my strong point. Yes, I grinned. I was so taken aback that, believe it or not, I didn't say anything. You know, I can be silent sometimes. Not often, but sometimes. But then you see, we, we had a good smile at that. But think of, think of it this way. People, isn't it true, people are very, very quick to say, well, well, wh whatever my faults, whatever my limitations, I'm not proud. Well, it depends what you mean by proud because you see it's all too easy to think of everything and to think of everyone in relation 
to ourselves. Now think of that. Thinking about every situation and everyone else in relation to ourselves. And that determines both our attitudes and our actions. We become self-conscious. We become self-centered. And isn't that pride? And isn't it so easy, we'll maybe say something about this in a few minutes, isn't it so easy to observe others and be very aware of the fact that, well, they're not as spiritual as they should be and they shouldn't, they don't do this, but on the other hand they do that and, well, almost without noticing it, we say, well, well and I do that and I do that and well, I'm spiritual, but they're not spiritual, and uh, isn't that pride? May I remind you of the words? We are not looking up the references tonight. They're recorded in Luke chapter 9 at verse 46. Jesus and his disciples were on the way to Jerusalem, and the whole drama was heading up to his, to his ultimate crucifixion, his tremendous agony in the garden of Gethsemane and his suffering death on the cross. Jesus and his chosen privileged disciples. Oh, they, they knew that they were chosen. They knew that they were the inner circle hand-picked by Jesus, personally taught by Jesus, Sharing fellowship with Jesus. Engage with Jesus in all the... Oh, can you imagine? Well, they, they were the ones who handed out the, 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 the loaves and the fishes and fed 5,000 people. But what were they thinking about and what were they talking about as they went with Jesus to Jerusalem for the crucifixion? they were discussing among themselves who was the greatest, who was the most spiritual. Pride is one of the most sinister snares in human life. And spiritual pride is the most sinister and most dangerous snare in the life of every Christian believer. As these disciples talked about themselves, Jesus Christ and his cross were simply pushed out of the picture. Humility is a very disturbing subject to consider. And we need always to be asking ourselves the question, what, what do we do as Christians that is real self-sacrifice? So things that cause us to be willing to do something that we would rather not do. To something that needs to be done. It should be done. It is, a, it is a necessary Christian piece of service. But we don't do it. Oh, we say, well, I, I did it last time. Or, oh, well, I, I've, I've, I'm going to... Yes. Spoke about it last week. I speak about it again. Oh, yes, I, I, oh, I always go there on a Wednesday. That's... That's the law of the Medes and the Persians that cannot be changed. That's not the principle of life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pride is a terrible thing 
we wouldn't, we wouldn't ever put it into words. But there creeps in upon us sometimes the thought that the work couldn't do without me. Oh, you say, I would never say that. No, I, I agree, you would never say that. But would you think it? Oh, you say, preacher, I'm not sure that I'd even think it. All right, I'll take you at your word. But does it not creep in upon us sometimes that to ourselves and even sometimes to others I do far more than they do? But what's that got to do with it? Do, do we measure out how much we are going to give to Christ in terms of service? Didn't the chapter begin, I, I beseech you, present your bodies, lock, stock, and barrel, as a living sacrifice? Paul is emphasizing in that third verse the grace of God. And we need to think in terms of the grace of God, especially when we are thinking about other people, and especially when we are tempted to criticize other people, because we never really know what the other person is struggling with. By the grace given to me, says Paul, I bid everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith which God has assigned or given him. Now, the measure of faith is not a measure of quantity, it's more to do with a standard or a quality or perhaps even more accurately it has to do with endowment or enablement for service. And, and this links up with not thinking too highly of ourselves but to think soberly and to rec recognize the measure of faith, the, the limitation of faith. And I think what Paul is saying here to Christians, now, don't, don't make extravagant claims about your spiritual life or your spiritual success or your spiritual um, service or your spiritual experiences. I, I get very worried nowadays about people who, who who's, the, the first thing they'll talk about is their spiritual experiences. And the more extraordinary that experience has been, especially if they haven't heard of anybody else quite having had that experience. But I remember about this man, Paul, who's saying these things. He had an experience in which he was caught up into the seventh heaven. And he wasn't sure whether it was whether he was physically lifted up off, off, off the earth or whether it was just a spiritual experience. And you know, he didn't tell anybody about it for 14 years. Now think soberly. Don't make extravagant claims about your spirituality. Don't go rushing into areas of service just because others do it. Don't go rushing into areas of service just because the opportunity is there. I think there's a great warning here, and it's a very necessary warning, with regard to Christians being overactive, being overcommitted, and overinvolved in too many different things. It has all to do with, with overstretching ourselves, refusing to recognize the limits of our human and our spiritual 
capacity and energy. I have often been greatly helped by and often greatly rebuked by the words of Jesus. I'll read them to you from Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, at verse 31. The context is the work of God under the leadership of Jesus Christ. And it was going great guns. And the disciples were involved and they were enjoying it up to the hill. If, if ever a group of men were enjoying Christian service, it was there. Oh, this was the life, serving Christ in the company of Christ. And Jesus said to them, Come away by yourselves to a lonely place and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And the story goes on that Jesus really had to constrain them. Oh, oh, but Lord, the opportunity. Oh, Lord, the need. Oh, these people waiting here. Oh, oh, they. Come away from all that activity. I, I, I like it in the, in, hello, people sometimes laugh at it, in the wording of the old authorized version. Come ye apart and rest a while. And one commentator says, and if you don't come apart and rest a while, you will come apart. And there are too many Christians, including Christians who are young in years, who by the time they're in their late twenties and early thirties, are really past it in terms of ongoing Christian service. They have simply run themselves into the ground with a whole variety of activities. And they are spent. And they are not only no use for any more Christian service, they are a burden. I turn over in my Bible... I'll read you all these verses to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 at verse 12. Now listen to Paul. Not that we venture to class or compare ourselves with some of those who commend themselves, but when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are without, they are not wise. But we will not boast beyond limit, but will keep to the limits that God has apportioned us to reach even to you, for we are not overextending ourselves. Oh, says Paul, let me be quite clear. <coughs> it is no part of my calling under God to get involved, to get in on every successful venture. It's a very necessary word. Accept recognizing and accepting the limitations, each according to the measure of faith which God has assigned to him. You know, and I've been around a long time now, and I've watched a lot of things, one of the sad things in Christian experience of a minister is to see so many Christians neglecting what is really their God-given work to get involved in other things. And there are some people, yes, now and there have been down through the years, there are some Christians who have owed a very great deal to this fellowship and to this work and to this ministry who have never really given their rightful commitment of service to their own home congregation. We have to recognize our limitations. 
we have to accept our limitations. We have to recognize that no one is indispensable. But at the same time, we have to see clearly the privilege of service. Oh, I hope you don't think that Christian service is a burden. It is a privilege. Don't, don't denigrate yourself. Don't think more highly than you ought to think. But to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith which God has assigned him for service. Do you see what that means? God is prepared to trust his service into your hands. There's little time left. Verses 4 and 5 speak about the church in the likeness of a body. As in one body we have many members and all the members do not have the same function but they're, they're all linked together. They're all necessary. The, 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 the body can't function properly if it's only got one leg or one arm or one eye or that kind of thing. And Paul applies the illustration spiritually. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members, one of... Notice, he doesn't say individually members of the body. He says that in Corinthians. He says here, individually we are members one of another. We are not separate. C Christian life and Christian service is not an individualistic thing. It's not an I'll do it my way kind of thing. We are members one of another. And you know, th this, this corrective to individualism is very necessary nowadays because we live in a society in which there is a great reluctance with regard to commitment. Wh whether we're talking about secular society or spiritual society. There are far too many people, far too many Christians, who reserve the right not to be in their place whenever they happen to choose. But these verses make plain, verses 4, 5, 4 and 5, 4, 5 and 6, make very plain that we cannot be true Christians, nor can we grow in grace, nor can we serve God effectively on our own, but only as increasingly and willingly being members of the body which is the church within the fellowship of individual congregations. But more specifically, I think, in these verses, 4, 5, and 6, Paul is saying we're all different. No one should try to be everything no one should try to do everything. Think of the effect, whether in the family at home or whether in church, when, when somebody says, I'll do it for you. I've sometimes in a pastoral situation trying to help, say, a husband and wife together. <coughs> sometimes I've almost got to say to one or other, Will you please give your partner an opportunity to say something? I'll, I'll maybe ask the husband a question. And just as he opens his mouth to answer, his wife answers. Now apply that in a wider way. Think of the effect when someone knows, Oh, I'll do it for you. On the one hand, you're making yourself indispensable. And of course, if you happen to be ill on any given occasion, then that, that area of the work is neglected. But this business of, oh, I'll do it for you, tends to make people feel they're no use and they're not needed. We belong together and we need each other. Of course, the, the opposite is, at times, we tend to leave everything for others 
to do. And whereas in the first illustration people are made to feel useless, on the other hand people are made to feel taken for granted. Now I'm trying to speak very plainly tonight. We may feel very spiritual. We, we may feel very committed especially when we always do certain things in a certain way at a certain time. But you know, that can sometimes be selfishness. Not allowing others to do these things. Or sometimes we do the things that are more obvious and more easy to do and leave others to do the harder things think now I'm treading on glass here but I'm willing to take a risk think of a prayer meeting <clears throat> if there happens to be a visiting missionary or if there happens to be a crisis a letter with a crisis situation read <clears throat> and if perhaps a bereavement has been mentioned then it's time for prayer and somebody prays for these three obvious things all at once now, the, these are the obvious, these are the easy things to pray about. But then later on, all sorts of people, all sorts of situations, all sorts of needs to be prayed for. Oh, well, you've, you've prayed your prayer, you. Is that Christian? We are members one of another. And if there is one thing as Christians we need to do, it is to encourage and to help each other, to, to prompt each other, to, to show other people that they are able to do certain things, and then to allow them to do it. And so Paul goes on. My time is really gone, but I'll just mention this. We'll come back to them another Sunday. Paul says, having, verse 6, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If your gift is prophecy or teaching or speaking out God's word, do it in proportion to our faith. I can still remember years ago being asking Willie Gilmore as a divinity student, He's now a minister, been so for many years. I asked him to do the Bible study in my absence. He said, oh, yes, Mr. Lyle, uh, yes, I, I will. He said, but Mr. Lyle, I won't be able to do it the way you do it. And I said, Willie, you're not supposed to do it the way I do it. You're supposed to do it your way, as long as you handle the Scriptures rightly and teach the Scriptures to the people. You know, again I'm treading in glass, but I'll take the risk. It's all being recorded. There are some young ministers who've created all sorts of problems for themselves, especially in the early years of their ministry, because they've tried to be William Still. I have an immense regard for that man, but he is absolutely unique. So don't you try to be like me. You try to be like Jesus. And if you feel that's maybe too high, well, you try to be like Paul. Or you try to be like Paul's young assistant, Timothy. You know, he was a fierty. He was very sensitive. Oh, he got all uptight about all things, all sorts of things. If you've got gifts, use them in proportion to your faith. If, you're, if your gift is encouragement, oh, use it. If, you're, if your gift is giving, oh, do it with liberality. If, if, you, if you're a helper. Some people sometimes said, oh, oh no, Mr. I, 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 don't, I don't lead the children's group sort of five mornings a week. I'm just a helper. Oh, what a glorious calling to be a helper.
Do you ever help people? Do you ever encourage people? Are you spiritually minded? Are you a real Christian? That's what Paul is saying here. And it was Jesus who said, Go into all the world and preach and teach and live and work in the name of God who gave his Son to be your Savior. And be willing to do anything that God wants you to do. And his will is wise and balanced. Be willing to be nothing. To be unrecognized. And I'll leave you with this. Willing to be nothing. Willing to be unrecognized. We sang it this morning. A stable place sufficed. The Lord God Almighty. Jesus Christ. The rest of the passage needs another sermon. May God bless to us his word.